All right. We're live. Here we are live. And I'm probably wrong about everything. And today is Laugh Tears number four, Quantum Means and Memes, August 11th, 2020. It's an honor to be here with Rob Grant. Thank you, Rob, for hosting us and letting us hijack your show. Thank you. <laughs> and it's a daughter you. to be with one of my best friends, Dr. Bradley Bobs. Thank you, Bradley Bobs. Can we just call you Bradley? Oh, call me what? Bradley. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. So let's start off simple and we'll get into quantum, you know, eventually. So what, Bob, Bradley, what first attracted you to pursue science or physics in the first place? Just a brief, like, where, where were you in your life? And you went, this is what I want to pursue. Why did you pursue it? And, you know, tell us a little backstory. Well, um, my father was an engineer, civil engineer, and he used to teach me uh, scientific principles when I was really small, um, you know, in grade school. He taught me drafting, you know, at, 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 I was about six years old, I think, taught me how to draft. Um, and uh, I loved to play with tinker toys and build things. That was the, that was the, the constructs kit at the time. I don't, I don't remember if it was before Legos, but uh, but what really fascinated me was was the Helms Bakery on Venice Boulevard. Uh, it's 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 no longer a bakery now; it's a shopping center. But but it's still marked as as the Helms Bakery. When I was uh, you know very very young. Uh, my older brother was in the Cub Scouts, and they had a field trip to the Helms Bakery, and I got to go along. And they had this this uh, bakery all automated. They had machines that would not only uh, slice the bread, loaves of bread, move them around, but would actually wrap them. A machine would would wrap and seal the bread automatically. And I just was so fascinated with that. I decided then I wanted to get into, you know, technology and the kind of, you know, the kind of uh, science and technology that can do something as amazing as, as wrap a loaf of bread and, and stack them up. You know. That was really good. And you kept brief and you summed it up because we're going to go to Rob now. Rob, your show is called I'm Probably Wrong About Everything. I've been on several times and we mainly talk philosophy. Why would you say I will do a show on science and technology today on quantum? What what is your deep down interest in that topic? Well, I uh, the, the quantum is my understanding of it as as an extreme amateur uh, is that it's the smallest of something, and it really kind of brings into focus of what is reality uh, because it's. We do we really see through our eyes or do we see through our minds, and and that's something that that uh, Dr. Bob's was was showing us in our slides that when they're talking about the light particle and how is light a wave or is light a particle? Well, according to quantum physics, things that we can't observe with the naked eye, um, it's neither. And and I think that in our society, and going back to the, the the title of the show, I'm probably wrong about everything. Well, in our society, we kind of have to have sort of uh, um, certain schemas, pre prearranged agreements, so that we can carry on. But but really, a lot of this is just sort of ad hoc uh, and 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 perhaps arbitrary sort of agreements of okay, yeah, this is this, this is it, so we can kind of keep going on. But when you start to break it down, you really begin to ask yourself, what is anything? That's brilliant. Let's. That you jump to a lot of deep things we're going to get into, but let's stay on the surface a little here just to get our basis. Beautiful. Sure. Well put both gentlemen. Bradley, what's the difference between art and science? Because, you know, we meet on a ground where you've in, in, enlightened me to, to science and technology a lot, but as well, you're a great poet and a great entertainer and a, an appreciator of 
you know, you're truly like me. We appreciate great music, great film, yeah. great art. And so what's the difference, basically? How would you differentiate? And then we'll go to Rob after. How would you differentiate between art and science? Well, it's, it's really in terms of what its purpose, what its goal is. Science is based at, on figuring out, you know, how to, uh, you know, understanding the world around us to the point where we can, we can do things with it. We can accomplish, we can build machines, build devices that do things that we want to do. Uh, and, you know, you have to get creative to do that. Um, art is a different kind of creativity, which is aimed at uh, affecting our emotions, trying to make us feel certain ways, mm -hmm. you know? That was really good, summed it up well. Okay, Rob, how do you differentiate between art and science? Uh, I, I, I sound like I'm echoing uh, Dr. Bradley here, but I think- well, we're I'm still alive, alive, so. It, it, oh, they, thank you very much. Wow. Well, well, um, but science is it's science is like the scientific method, and it's it's a means of understanding something in our world, uh, trying to to break it down and 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 understand, deduce what a thing is. Whereas I think art, and, and this is a hasty generalization, but generally speaking, art to me is an exploration. So science is an understanding and art is an exploration, but both of them are human in the sense of, of they, 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 they're innate and they're invented, not to jump the gun here or anything like that, but there's, there's a propensity in us to create and to understand. And art is the creation and science is the understanding perhaps. Really good. And so, you know, you you both touched on what McLuhan said, that the job of the artist is to show us what the world is made of. So maybe that's why he named his book, The Laws of Media, The New Science, because he was saying, hey, this is what the world's made of. Isn't that what science does? It shows us what the world's made of and art shows us what the world is made of. So there's a lot of crossover there. And it was interesting what words you both gentlemen both use because I also heard this. I'm going to ask Rob to respond first. I heard this one once and I thought it was interesting. Science uncovers and discovers new facts that can be interpreted many ways. What's your take on that, Rob? And then we'll go to Bradley. Well, you, you had a really good quote. Uh, I forget who said this, but I would rather have a uh, questions that I can't answer than answers that I can't question. Yeah. And uh, science, it, it's similar to the Socratic method of sometimes we find out what something is by determining what it isn't. And then we kind of get closer and closer to what it is. And I think that the quantum is kind of like that. I think Schro, here's where my, you know, what do I know is coming in, but Schrodinger said that there's only so many outcomes that could happen. Right. And we don't necessarily know what one might be, but we can rule out that there's only a maximum of, say, four possible outcomes. And I think that that's what we're trying to get to is we're trying to to get closer to the answers. By finding out what what it isn't. Yeah, that's good. And Bradley, what do you think of that line? Science uncovers facts that can be interpreted many ways. Well, um, yeah, there are clearly um, interpretations of of the facts. You know, right? Science does uh, pretty much find facts, and uh, it's not always clear what to make of them. Um, now, over a hundred years ago, one hundred twenty years ago, say, it was a lot more straightforward as far as what science was telling us, but with quantum physics, it really ushered in a new era where the interpretation of the facts took on a, I mean, really exploded. And um, there have been, you know, from the beginning, there have been great controversies among physicists as far as how to interpret uh, quantum physics 
and uh, and they've been debating it ever since, and it, it still goes on. And um, I Thank still you. I still read things by said by great physicists. You know, I can't deny they're brilliant Nobel Prize winning physicists, and they give interpretations, and I'm shaking my head and say, how can they think that? It's obvious. <laughs> It's, it's obviously this way, you know. Well, Br Bradley, that's like that's like the great Lord Buckley joke. It's like you're happy because they're still thinking about it because it gives you a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no money in, in interpreting content. There's no money at it philosophically. But but anybody who who has the the opportunity to see Bradley Bob's gives the give his quantum um presentation live he does it for free by the way is pretty amazing and it should be you should you should charge and be getting you know 50 to you know it should be a 50 dollar ticket but you guys are both edging into quantum so i just wanted to inform the audience a little so they know where we're going with this because quantum comes from the word quantity or it's rooted in the word quantity mm -hmm which is Latin Quantus. And I think it's amazing that Quantus Latin means of what size, how much, how great, in what amount. But let me just read before you, you answer this question, Bradley. In 1610s, quantum came from Latin quantum, meaning some or amount. And it sort of goes into those questions that the word quantus, Latin, of what size, how much, how great, what amount. But it was Max Planck in 1900, he introduced the word in physics on the notion of minimal amount of quantity which can exist. That was reinforced by Einstein in 1905, then quantum theories 1912, then quantum mechanics 1922, then 54 quantum jump, abrupt transition from one stationary state to another, and then quantum leap is figurative, a large advance in 1963. So what I'm most curious about Bradley, is for you to clarify how the word meaning has grown and changed. Well, um, you know, before before Max Planck, it it wasn't clear. It just meant, meant a, a quantity, uh, as you said. Um, but the word. Uh, Quantum in Latin is singular, so it implies it's one of something. So it raises the question: How do you have a how do you have a, a quantity of one? What does that mean? And uh, Max Planck saw a way to give that meaning, um, in that it was a unit of quantity. So when you talk about time, you could have you could have units of hours or seconds, you know, you talk about length, it could be millimeters or feet or whatever. But what is the unit of quantity? It's how many you have of something. And it raises the issue of, of is, it, is that always countable? Can you always count how many you have of anything? And what he and Einstein found was that, that yes, when you measure, for example, they were, they were looking at light really. And whenever you measure light, you're measuring a number of things of, of, of quanta. Quanta is the plural of quantum, but there's some basic unit and called a quantum, which is the minimum amount of light that, that's possible. And any light that you have is always a, a multiple of those. So they're, they're not, they, they were later called photons, a quantum of light. And light is always counted in how many photons is it? It's got to be some whole number of photons. There's no such thing as half a photon or any fraction of a photon or 3.7 photons. It has to be a whole number of photons anytime you ever see light. 
So yeah, Rob, jump in anytime. But when you said the word things, so clarify, is that a unit? When you said things, I was curious what, how you could ex ex expound on that. Well, it's, it is, a, it is a unit um, of quantity in that uh, it's how quantity is measured. How many do you have? Yeah. And then that raises the question of what, how many of what? So that whatever that is, is got to be some kind of thing. You identify that as, as uh, some, some thing called, called a quantum. It's an amazing word, isn't it, thing? Because here we are in Rob's show. I'm probably wrong about everything. You could rename it. I'm probably wrong about every quantum. <laughs> sure. Or unit. But but Bradley, tell us what you know. I know you're this is your emotion involved in this, and and it's good because you're passionate. What what do people they use quantum all the time, and like it's the last it's the last and etymology the last one is quantum leap a large sudden advance 1963 often figurative. So how, why does that fire you up? Tell us about that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not against adapting the language when there's some kind of sense behind it, when there's some reason for it. Okay. But um, in this case, first of all, there's, there's no reason to use the word quantum to describe something that's large. There's nothing large about a quantum. A quantum is the smallest possible thing that you can have. So introducing the word large just makes no sense. And it, uh, instead of adding to the language, adding a new capability to the language, which is, which is a reason for you know, changing, the, changing the language, it's muddling it. Now people talk about quantum. Do they mean something big or something small? You know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's kind of de decreasing the capability of the language to describe things. It's muddling it up and kind of reducing everything to some common denominator. It's like, it's like when people say awesome, like, you know, yes. like oh, I went to the restaurant. It was awesome versus awesome. Like, it is all yes. yeah. right? like if you see, you know, the pyramids of, of, of Egypt, that's awesome. Not going to the store and buying fresh bread. Right, right. It, it loses its meaning when it's applied to everything. Right. You know, and, um, you know, the, the idea of the, the quantum leap being something, something big, obviously was thought up by someone who had no idea whatsoever what a quantum is. They have just have no clue. Um, but they heard it and they thought it was a cool word and they hear it used in, in cool discussions and all. And they thought, oh, I'm going to apply this word. And since I don't know what it means, I'm just going to make it mean something big and great, you know. And, and what's happening to our language is that every word in the language means something big and great, you know. You can't communicate anymore because all, all words are, are kind of converging on having all the same meaning. Really well put. But why do you think they picked 63? Any guess? It says it went figurative to quantum leap in 1963. Any guess why they etymology online? I tend to believe that these people are studious and they study the history of words. Any guess why 63, Bradley? Um, no, it's and that might not be the right year. I mean, that's that's probably the, the year of the earliest known instant that any instance that any could anyone could find yeah. of someone using the expression that way. And it just happened to be that year. I I don't remember anything happening. Let's see, I think uh, JFK got shot that year. Uh, but that wouldn't have anything to do with it. Um, That's amazing because you know it's it's something for grounds for further research. And what you said was what Eric McLuhan taught us about the word fake and the word fact, they both come from Latin to make. Yeah. So 
you know, <laughs> we we want to believe, you know, that fake is not a fact and a fact is a fact. But if they're both rooted in to make, it's back to his dad's thing that art is showing us what the world is made of. So, I mean, Bradley, how do you cope? I mean, that's the big question. How do you cope? when people misuse quantum like you're you're at a cocktail party and uh, i know you're a great partier i've been with par parties with you you know how to schmooze with people because parties yeah. are a time where people break everything down and they want to be honest when they misuse quantum how do you handle it you just go along or do you kindly try to clarify how do you cope with the misuse um, well, you're right. Anytime I hear about a party, I'm, I'm there if I can be. Um, but uh, um, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't think I've ever personally encountered someone who was misusing the word quantum. Um, I, I've, I hear it various places. I even wrote a letter to the editor of a uh, scientific magazine about it once. They, they published my, I wrote a long editorial about misuse of the word quantum got published. Um, usually when I'm talking to people, uh, parties or wherever, the words that I hear misused a lot are energy, uh, frequencies, vibrations. And um, they use the, these are words that are used a lot in physics, but they're using it in some totally different sense and I get the feeling they have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, I, I could understand if they wanted to use the same word to mean something different, but they talk about somebody having, any, having an energy, somebody having a frequency, and I try to find out what it is they mean, and um, they never seem to know what it is they mean, what it is they're trying to say. I get the feeling they heard some cool words and they're just throwing them into their language, without really having any understanding of what it is they're trying to say. Yeah, again, Rob, it's perfect to have Bradley on your show. I'm probably yeah. wrong about everything. I got some good <laughs> vibrations, which is, you know. There you go, good vibrations. This, you know? is the, this is the Beach Boys in the 60s singing good vibrations, using a theremin. I mean, I'm not a Beach Boys fan, but I can appreciate the fact that they put a theremin in oh, yeah. their song. Pretty amazing. Well, break down those three words. Let's start with energy. What, what, you know, oh, I have a lot of energy. How is that, you know, suss out that word, what you were talking about? Well, um, yeah, a lot of people talk about feeling energetic, feeling that they have a lot of energy. And that kind of makes sense that they, they feel they can move around a lot. You know, they, they've, um, you know, their, their, their body is generating motion or maybe, um, you know, there may be activity in their brain or something like that. And so it's kind of related to the physical, the physics meaning of, of energy. But um, I'm thinking more of people who are talking about, I don't know, like auras, like this person has got a certain kind of energy. And I don't know what they're talking about. And and I don't think you go to a concert. Yeah, like, like if you go to a concert and somebody's like, man, I was feeling the vibrations. It's like, right. but, but maybe, they, maybe they, they were, right? I mean, because it's like when you listen to a record versus when you yeah. see a concert live, are you getting a different frequency or vibration or energy from that? Yeah, well, those are real. You know, I mean, yeah. sound is vibration. Sound has frequency. Right. There's energy in it. So those, those kind of mean, meanings I can understand. I'm thinking more of these uh, kind of uh, mystical um, uses of, of those words that don't seem related to anything actually vibrating in them. Um, you know, I can, I, I can kind of understand the, the Beach Boys and, and far be it from me to criticize the Beach Boys. They're, they're the best. You know, they're brilliant. I'm, I'm certainly going to give them any, any kind of pass on using words any way they want because what they do is wonderful. Uh, using the theremin and all, so cool. So, and are, are you, a great song. 
are you sort of saying more in terms of human behavior, a uh, certain human behaviors being associated to energy frequency vibration when really it's just human behavior? Is that sort of what you're talking I, about? I guess it is. I guess they're talking about behavior. I'm, I'm not sure what they're talking about. Um, I, can, like I go to parties and people are like, yeah. yeah, he's got a good energy. And it's like, well, he's been doing cocaine for the last 24 hours. So yeah, he's got yeah. great energy. Right. right. I'm not sure. Are they saying he's he's energetic? He's he's moving around a lot. He's thinking a lot. They move in energy in that way, or uh, sometimes you know it, it, they, they it's just not clear what what they mean. You know, and and vibrations. You know, I can understand vibrations kind of bring up the idea of resonance. That you know, two things, um, two things that are vibrating can can resonate with each other. That, you hit a, a, a you hit the right frequency and the energy builds up, and I can see that you know using that in kind of an emotional sense. Two people are on the same wavelength, the same frequency. That I can kind of understand, um, but it's some of these other other more mystical uses, I guess, that that seem to be just carrying it beyond the point of any reason. Well, looking at your slides, a, a lot that was coming up again as an amateur, but there's light and there's sound. And for energy, frequency, vibration, there's it's light and sound versus like feeling, right? Because mm -hmm. feeling is kind of a complicated one, but it's light and oh, sound. Yeah. That, so that's why music, it makes sense. That's sound. Those are, but are those waves? Are they particles? And then there's light, right? We get energy from the sun. That's light. Yeah. You know. Again, but what what is light? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? And then and then that's what they're talking about in quantum. And and really, it's like when we try to define things, is there any definition that's perfect for any one thing? Because they're all just kind of those are those prearranged agreements, right? Like the quantum leap going from zero to ten, not zero through to ten. But we, right. we, when we hear quantum leap. We think Star Wars and like. Phew, there we're at the next planet <laughs> but really a quantum leap is it's unobservable by the naked eye that's how small it right is. a quantum leap is related to the fact that you everything every quantity is a multiple of a certain some number of quanta so you can have three quanta or four quanta you can't have three and a half so how did you get from three to four you had to take a leap from three to four without going through any of the, the, the not quantities in between those, those quantities don't exist. So that a, a quantum leap refers to the fact that, uh, that you have to change things have to change in whole numbers. So last question, sorry, Jerry, I, I got to ask this no, one, but no, do, do, yeah. do, quanta, do they like metastasize or what happens? How do you get, how do you get from three to four without there being, you know, a fermentation or whatever? Oh, it, it, it depends on the specific example, what type what, of what it is, yeah. what's happening. Uh, so, you know, talking about a quantum leap, I'm, I'm trying to talk about it in very general terms, but as far as what actually happens, you know, you'd have to take some specific case. Depending on what it is that's know. being observed. Yeah, right. 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 Well, uh, Brett, yeah. that was good. You raised a lot, Rob, there. One is, what's a wave a call? Because, you know, I first heard Frank Zappa saying there's a there's a wave and there's a particle and then there's a wave a call. And then I re researched it and he didn't come up with it. So what is... You know, help us walk us through in layperson's term, wave particle and wavicle, Bradley. Okay, well, um, a particle is something that's small and it's located at a specific spot. It's localized. Okay, and um, the way this is illustrated in um, the way this was first came up in quantum physics. Well, maybe not the first time, but but the way it's it's most clearly demonstrated is called the the double slit experiment, um, where you have uh, some kind of barrier, just a piece of cardboard, saying you cut two slits in it next to each other, 
and then you let light pass through that. Well, one thing that you can show is that a particle of light can only pass through one of those. It never, it never passes through both at the same time. It passes through one or the other, and this has been proven zillions of times that it, it never goes through both. Even though you will often hear physicists saying it goes through both, the experimental um, results show that it it never goes through both. It always goes through one or the other. They are they are they are doing some interpreting, okay, in order to make that statement. So uh, if you look at light as particles, then it goes to one slit or the other slit because it's something localized occurs in one place. It's, it, it can be one or the other, take one path or another path. It can't take, it doesn't take multiple paths. Okay, now um, what's, what's really confusing about all this is that the results of what happens when you pass light through double slits had uh, already been fully explained by taking light to be a wave. And a wave is something like, like an ocean wave. Uh, picture an ocean wave rush, heading towards the shore, heading towards the beach. It's spread out. It's spread out over some, some wide, some very wide range. And if you had a wall in the ocean, say with two slits, the wave would go through both of those slits. You know, it, it, it's spread out, it, it, it clearly hits both. Well, if you do this with light, which, you know, um, then it had already been shown, it was well established, you know, back long before, uh, long before Einstein, that the light wave goes through both slits and it produces a, a pattern which is described by wave theory, described by waves that go through both slits. And so it was proven that light must be a wave. It, it follows the rules for waves. Uh, then the photon was discovered, the quantum of light, the particle of light. And that was found to only go through one slit. So it's very unclear what is happening and what light is. You can look at light as a wave, you can look at light as a particle, and whichever way you look at it, um, you can do experiments to show that you're wrong. And so the only reasonable conclusion is that light is neither a wave nor a particle. It's something that we don't know how to describe, and you can call it a wavicle. A wavicle is a way of expressing the fact that you don't know if this is a localized particle or a, a spread out wave. And whatever, you, if you try to describe it as either, you can be proven wrong. Wow, that was really clear, Bradley, thank you. Because, you know, a lot of what you're talking about resonates with our McLuhan studies and you've uh, attended our Tetrad meetings for years because oh, yeah. resonance is Resonance is tactility, this important thing about senses, that McLuhan said tactility is not this hand touching this hand. Tactility is the in-between space, the resonating interview, interval, the, the space between the hands touching. That allows us to feel and have touch because we don't have touch. So a lot of it sounds like mumbo jumbo, poetic hieroglyphics, but especially I would love for you to tell me something Marshall taught us was effects precede causes, meaning Surratt, the French painter, used dots of paint. That's pointillism. Pointillism to paint a picture. It's mosaic painting. And in fact, McLuhan learned from James Joyce, it was mosaic writing. It's putting together a lot of little things to come up with a big thing. So it's almost an illusion. And so we were looking at paintings by Surratt, pointillism, and it was basically preparing us for electronic pointillism, which is television, 
where it's a lot of lines or metaphorically dots put together. You know, you've been in the Pixel Vision Film Festival. It's like metaphorically, it's 2,000 dots instead of 200,000 dots. And in essence, that's what we're doing right now is a live TV show. So there's probably 200,000 dots up there making us look like we're here. <laughs> Are we really here? <laughs> like no, Carla we're Pat. not. <laughs> yeah, our, Carla Pat. It sure feels like you two guys are here with me. So what does, and then I said, Bradley, as, as effects proceed causes ever come up in science or physics? And you go, yes. And I was like amazed because most people go, well, it sort of sounds bullshitty. What does effects proceed causes mean in physics and science? Well, um, let's see. Um, we could start with uh, thermodynamics. Okay, before quantum physics, there was thermodynamics was the way of uh, describing, um, you know, how how things would change, how uh, many particles would evolve in time, and uh, a key point that came up in this is. The, the quantity called the uh, entropy. Entropy is, is a measure of how much disorder there is in something. So low entropy means something is, is structured, it's non-random. It's, and uh, large entropy is where things are random, they're just kind of all mixed up and jumbled. And it was noted that entropy, um, one of, the, one of the laws of thermodynamics is that entropy always increases. And so this gives a direction for time. Um, all of the other laws of physics up to that point were all symmetric with time going forward or backwards. Um, and, you know, people would question, you know, well, how do we know which way time is going? <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> how do we know it's going forwards? Maybe it's going backwards. Maybe it's going back and forth or, or what, you know, but entropy was labeled times arrow because entropy was something that would distinguish whether time was going forward or backward. If entropy was increasing, that meant time was going forward. And so that established the direction of time. But how does that uh, relate to effects perceived causes? Because that was brilliant. You really helped me understand entropy. Thank you. Well, well, because before you you can understand how effects might precede causes or what that even means, you have to establish what is the meaning of precede. Right. Precede means it comes before it in time. That is heavy because both James Joyce and Frank Zappa have taught me that all times are happening now. What's your take on that? Oh, I don't know. Sounds like a sounds like BS, but uh, but it might have, <laughs> it might have some meaning. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Well, in the uh, okay, this gets into relativity theory. There you go. Which developed concurrently with quantum physics. In fact, it pretty much started with the same person the same year. Um, in, in one year, Einstein published uh, the first paper on um, relativity. And also, um, one of the first papers on quantum theory. Um, you know, the only person talking about quantum theory before that was Max Planck just a few years before. And it really hadn't developed to the point. Uh, it wasn't, he was just getting it, getting it going. You could say Einstein, in some sense, you could say Einstein really started the idea of a, of a quantum. So in relativity, um, it turns out that time changes depending on uh, speed, depending on how fast something is going. And in the limit of something going at the speed of light, which would be something, for example, light going at the speed of light, 
time stops and all times are the same and all times are occurring simultaneously. That was good. Now let's let's get Rob in here for a second. What's faster, Rob? Speed of light or speed of thought? Just your, just your hunch. You don't have to speed, speed it. Speed, speed of you know what it is, but here, here's my answer: is that the light, like the light from the sun, takes about four, what is it? Four minutes to get here. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Close. So we're we're way farther than you know from the sun, but my mind's right here. So I'd say, relatively speaking, because I'm closer to my mind, that's faster than than light. But light is faster. If that makes okay. any sense. That's really good, Brad. <laughs> Because it's it's a deep question, and you should hear how I've asked that question for thirty years. I get all kinds of answers. Bradley Bob's, what's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? Well, it's definitely light. And as far as you know, uh, light coming from the sun taking eight minutes. Well, how long would it take your thought to get to the sun? Your <laughs> thought is traveling, yeah. you know, a few millimeters inside your brain. It's, yeah. It may seem like it's going quickly. Um, but it's not going very far. And uh, also, the speed of thought and the speed of, of light are both so fast that you really can't tell a difference, you know, at least, you know from, from just looking at it. But um, it's, it's definitely got to be the speed of light because, for one thing, nothing can go faster than light. So we know that the speed of thought is not going to be faster because nothing is faster. Um, and and uh, thought, you know, we know is uh, has to do with the neurons sending electrical pulses um, to communicate. It's all comes down to that, and all of those things go so much slower than light. Yeah, they're they're they seem fast to us, but you know they seem instantaneous to us. But then so does light. But if you actually look at it, light is is definitely faster. It's good. It reminded me of uh, what's the Roadrunner cartoons called and Warner Brothers old Roadrunner cartoons. Um, you mean you know, uh, Wiley Coyote? Yeah, Wiley Coyote oh, yeah. and the Roadrunner. And uh, the Roadrunner has uh, his his business card. It says, have brains, will travel. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, does he move fast. But, you know, that was good. Bradley, you sussed out relativity theory a little. I still don't get it quite. So you can tell tell me more, but or tell us more. But there's another three words that I always get confused on what it means, and it's something unified theory. I'm leaving out one word. What field. is it? Unified field theory. Okay. How does what is unified field theory, and how does it relate to relativity theory? Um, unified field theory is the attempt to combine relativity theory and quantum theory. Wow. So relativity you... theory usually deals with things that are very big. It's dealing with, you know, galaxies, black holes, you know, um, light traveling throughout the universe, things on a, on a large scale, um, generally. And quantum theory is dealing with very tiny things, you know, atoms, electrons. Um, but, uh, you know, starting with Einstein and many physicists since, they've, they've got to unify them. They've got to find the theory that underlies them both because there should be some, some basic rules that govern the universe that that uh, make everything happen. So, um, you know, the, the the universe isn't really divided into, well, these things follow the theory of relativity and these things follow quantum theory. But unified field, field theory is interesting. Tell me what they mean by the word field there and bring in why they always drop this word, system systems theory systems that systems this does that relate to this word field um systems uh i don't know i, I don't really hear that 
a lot in connection with field theory. Okay. You hear that more in, in, in engineering. Um, in engineering is systems. Usually. I mean, it could be applied, but it's, um, it's not really a, a key uh, concept in uh, unified field theory. So, but is unified field theory suss out what their meaning field metaphorically and for real? Is it a spit like a, a football field? Is it a, a designated area? Is it an environment? What are they meaning unified? I know what unifying means, but why did you throw yeah. the word field in there? Um, well, fields are, are really the, the basis for. Um, physics for all kinds of uh, forces, for all kinds of interactions going on in physics. They're all uh, based on the existence of, of fields. A field is some quantity that varies uh, over space and time. And um, it's not something we can detect directly, but we, but it, it influences things. And it, and so we can, indirectly uh, measure all, all kinds of properties of fields. It's, it's not clear how real a field is. It's something that we kind of, uh, that physicists invent. It's part of a theory about them in order to explain what happens or to predict what happens. But fields could be like uh, gravitational fields, uh, electric fields, magnetic fields, and then uh, and then there are the electric and magnetic fields that are in light. Right. Or acoustic fields in sound. Right. So Robert Sapolsky, uh, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm saying his name right, wrote the book Behave. And in it, he talks about how if you look at behavior, you can't just look at it through one lens. It, it, it really is. An, it requires an eclectic understanding. Right. So he's bringing all these fields together to try and understand, explore, explain human behavior. Where I'm going with this is, is that kind of what unified field theory is? Is that what's being united is all these different disciplines? Uh, sort of, yeah, same basic idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, primarily, you know, quantum theory and relativity theory, which right. generally apply to totally different domains, right. but trying to, trying to unify them um, in sort of some so the fundamental laws of physics that describe everything, whether whether it's big or small, whether it's fast or slow, um, right. they'll all have to follow these laws. Theory. Right, right. Yeah. We we figure you know the there there we we have our own you know our own sets of laws that that we invent. Um, and we, they divide them up into categories, but you know the universe probably doesn't divide things up into categories and decide, well, these things are going to follow these rules, and these and those things are going to follow those rules. The you know nature probably has one set of rules that everything follows. It just um, uh, manifests it del it's, itself in different ways. Are the laws of nature cruel? <laughs> Well, you know, cruelty is, uh, is, I guess, more of a human concept, an ethical concept. And uh, I would say they don't apply to the laws of nature. Cruelty can only be used to describe what a human being does. Or, Good. you know. Brad, beautiful answer. And who's entitled to make the laws of science? Well, it's not a matter of being entitled. It's a matter of being able to come up with ideas and to uh, demonstrate or to have demonstrated that the laws work, that they give correct predictions, that they um, explain what we see, that they allow us to, to, uh, to make things. And, um, you know, in, in, in quantum physics, I mentioned there was a lot of controversy over interpreting it. I should also mention that there is basically no controversy whatsoever as far as what the laws of quantum theory are. It's like everybody agrees 100% hmm. 
the, the, the laws of quantum physics have been proven over and over so many times that there is, there is really no doubt as to what the laws are. And so you're talking about who was entitled to make the laws. That's not really a question, you know, um, maybe uh, centuries ago, you know, uh, there was, uh, you know, back in the times of Galileo, there was dispute over, well, should should scientists be allowed to make the laws or should the church be entitled to make the laws? But that's not really a question anymore. The, the laws are supported um, or they're either proven or disproven by experiments. And it's only the interpretation of them where the controversy comes in. But these are things that are usually unprovable. Yeah, really well put. And just to return to quantum, the word quantum, here's a, in 2011, a Russian newspaper man, you know, he like runs the biggest newspaper in Russia. He said, a quantum of media expression is no longer an issue for a newspaper. It has shrunk down to an article. So if you could, Bradley, talk about that word, use of the word quantum there. Is he doing it right or wrong? And then I got a follow-up question. You want me to read I, it again? I didn't understand that. Maybe, maybe say it again. Yeah. I, I didn't quantum, follow what he was this saying. Is new, this is a, Ruski, uh, excuse me, a Russian newspaper man. A quantum of media expression is no longer an issue of a newspaper. It is shrunk down to an article. I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> is, is he, do you think he's misusing the word quantum? I, I guess so, because I can't figure out what it is he's trying to say. <laughs> because the, 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 the question I have to follow up is, how do you gain further knowledge on your research through articles, newspapers? What do you rely on? Word of mouth, you know, websites? How do you acquire further exploration besides doing the experiments yourself? Like talk us, talk us through your process a little. Well, uh, in uh, physics, there are uh, journals where work is published. And um, before it can get published, it has to be reviewed. It's reviewed by, you know, capable scientists. And if they're, you know, usually a few reviewers, and if there are disagreements, those, you know, they might go back and forth until those are resolved. And, uh, and a journal gets a reputation as being reputable or non-reputable. Um, a friend of mine was pointing out some, some theory he had heard, which sounded very, very strange. So I, I was curious and I, and I looked it up and it was published in a journal. I thought, wow, this strange result, it must be true. How else did it get published? Well, I did a little more research and I found that this journal, it had a, a very innocuous name. It was like, you know, Journal of Physics or something. Some, something that just sounds like, oh, that must be official. Right. But it, it turns out that this journal publishes all kinds of junk. <laughs> it's the, and and I, I think people pay to get published in it. Yeah. So it's a journal for, for wannabe physicists who want to get published, but they, they don't know what they're doing. They can't get published in a real journal, so they get published in this journal. Yeah. <laughs> they, they probably pay a lot of money to get published there. Yeah, you, and there are a lot of websites that do that, too, of course. So you're a poet, you know, because for years there's been these poetry books in America where you can pay to have your book, your poem yeah. published, and they're not as reputable. But, you know, this is interesting because it's like what we call credibility. Right. And, yeah. you know, we want to rely on sources that are credible. And then we'll see that the New York Times might publish something that we want to doubt, too. So it is with this rise of what's called disinformation or fake news. It is, to me, a means for people to sharpen their critical thinking skills which you, you just proved. You said, well, I wanted to find out what the source was and you investigated further. That's critical thinking. That's research, you know. 
Yeah, and in in uh, science and physics specifically, there are you know excellent channels for establishing the credibility of something, and everything that's published in them is constantly being reviewed by very smart people all over the world. And if anybody tries to publish some bullshit, they will get caught. Right. You know, this is not saying they can't publish some strange way out ideas, but they're going to have to have those ideas are going to have to be backed up. Well, really well put. Go ahead, Rob. I, I, I try not to bring this guy up all the time, but Joseph Goebbels, go, excuse me, Joseph Goebbels, uh, who is the media propagandist behind Hitler? He said, uh, "Worse oh, yeah. effect, oh. don't appeal to their intellect; appeal to their emotions." Right. And so when we see these, like, you know, uh, COVID vaccine causes cancer, it's like, well, it hasn't even been out that long enough to make that connection, right? Yeah. Or Larry King's Doctor Prostate Medicine. Well, clearly that doesn't work too well. Uh, you know, anyways, <laughs> it's just. It's we see these sens sensationalism and it's like, what does the human mind appeal to? Because you're talking about credibility and the process of getting a peer reviewed journal article published takes years. Right. Well, it, it could take up to years. Well, it, it I, don't, might, I don't know the actual process. You know, I mean, they, they try to keep it going quickly because, you know, it they, could they don't be, want to yeah. hold things up. Yeah. But it, it might take years if it's something very controversial. It might take years to establish. But writing that versus writing, uh, you know, a hit piece for the time, you know, versus like I'm writing an editorial on my thoughts about this, right? An opinion piece. But right. sometimes yeah. people see those and they're pulled into that. So it at the end of the day, it's like, you know, which one – are we generally speaking more drawn to and, and and that comes down to the fact versus fake and how they're you uh jerry was talking about that they're both creations right so which creation are we more drawn to the fact or the fake yeah and um usually we don't know yeah we don't know which it is and uh so i you know, if I don't know if something's true or not, I just take it with a grain of salt. I say, well, I heard this or I read this, but I'm not sure if it's true or not. Yeah, you know, that's funny, Rob. You must have ESP because I found this book. I found this book yesterday. Vintage oh, yes. Gravity's Rainbow. It's, a, it's you know, time is pinching trying to be Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. What does he start with? Beyond zero, the opening quote, another Hitler, former Hitler guy, Werner von Braun, you know, part of Project Paperclip, all of these scientists who worked for Hitler and then came right. to America and helped build our military. Here's a quote I'd love to get your reaction to, Bradley, and you, Rob, too. Werner von Braun, nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Now, he jumps around a little there. What would you say to that, Bradley? Oh, I don't know. Rob, why don't you take it? <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give. I'll give you. That's too. That's too easy. I'll let. I'll let Rob. <laughs> give, give it. Well, give it. To, give it to the guy whose whose show is titled. I'm probably. Yeah. 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 Rob, I have no read, idea. Rob. Rob. Let me read it one more time because okay. it is. It's bringing. You can go into it various aspects. It's. It, it sounds like it's almost like a two parter. But, it but is go a ahead. Part of, but go into wherever you want, because nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Is science nature or is it nurture? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. We, we, we create the scientific law and really it's just 
things that we can experiment, like uh, Bradley was talking about experiments, right? And it, anybody could do an experiment. That's why we use Latin. It's a dead language. It's a, un, it's a quote unquote universal language, although Latin's pretty Western if you ask me, but whatever. Yeah. Um, this idea of is it, is it, is a truth always a truth? Right. And sometimes we can, we can look back and say, Oh, that wasn't really right. What, you know, happened then. But at that time there was a zeitgeist of that is the right way. That's the truth, but that's not a, that's not a capital T truth. Whereas science tries to determine universal truths, like what is light. And then you get the Heisenberg uh, guy sorry. who's like, WTF is anything, you know, well, what we could find out is that we, we know this thing is there, but we don't really know why it does it. And that's something that I've noticed in my own life is that, you know, the timeless questions are, are often the why ones, like, why are we here? Uh, you know, if God exists, why is he such an a-hole sometimes, you know, things like that. <laughs> and yeah, and let, I think let, let, let Bradley go on that for a second. Yeah. Bradley, What's your take on Heisenberg and just what Rob said? How would you process that? Um, well, you talk talk about, you know, is, is science nature or nurture? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, science is really, a, it's a, a human activity. Right. Um, it's, not, it's not nature. Nature exists independently of us. At least that's what I think. Yeah. And um, we invent science to try to understand it and explain it and use nature. Yeah. Right. And so then, we're observing uh, yeah. nature. Right. Right. We're observing it and trying to, uh, it's, it's about being able to describe it in a way that will make predictions. What will, what do we think will happen if we do this? And then that's, that's now useful information we can use to, uh, to build things with. But now, what's your take on Heisenberg? What does it mean to you as a physicist? What does Heisenberg mean to you? Is it applicable or is it a little... What's your take on it? Well, um, Heisenberg did a lot of things. He, uh, you know, he invented the, the matrix formulation of, of quantum theory, which is the alternative to the Schrodinger wave function. But what he's most known for, and what I think you're referring to, is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle yeah right yeah and um basically you know showing that one one of the things that quantum theory shows us is that we can't know everything not just because we haven't tried hard enough we're not smart enough yet we have to build better equipment or something but there's a fundamental uncertainty in nature itself that things are not as definite as you know our previous theories would wanted to believe that um you know science is not progressing towards that point where it can explain everything there are there are limits to how much can be predicted it turns out that you cannot predict what a single quantum will do. As far in every measurement we've ever done, um, the behavior of a single quantum is random as far as we can tell. We cannot find physical laws that will predict what a single quantum will do. The only thing we can predict is the statistical averages of what a large number of quantum will do. If we do a, an experiment with one quantum and we do it over and over and over again, many times, and we look at the statistics, that will follow quantum theory perfectly. But if we try to look at what happened for any one of the experiments, for any one quantum, um, we, we don't know the answer. And in fact, we can prove that we can't know the answer. 
Yeah, just as just as Bradley sums up the answer, Rob jumps off the podcast. <laughs> and, and I had no way of knowing that, that was he was gonna do that. <laughs> not, all all the laws of physics could not predict that, that would happen. Yeah, and, and and the great thing is, is you you just renamed Rob's show. It shouldn't be called. I'm probably wrong about everything. It should be called. We can't know everything. This is yeah. you can yeah. change your name of your show and say a scientist renamed my show. It's got to yeah. be true. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I have a, I have a comment on on the name of the show. Saying I'm I'm saying I'm wrong or probably wrong about everything is actually not so bad. Yeah, you know, it's not so bad to be wrong because it implies that at least it's it's sensible that it it it's it's sensible enough that that it could be either right or wrong. The worst that something could be is um, to be insulted the way that uh, Richard Feynman insulted some theory. He said some some theory he thought was so terrible. He he said that theory isn't even wrong oh. you know, for it to be wrong would have been an improvement it was so <laughs> terrible it it, it it was like undefinable right as, as to being right or wrong but uh, you know Feynman's one of my heroes don't you oh yeah yeah he's a hero and you know he he brought the um the tuba throat singers to Frank Zappa's house to jam and he was like an oh, amazing wow bongo player he was a real full-fledged oh yeah human and oh, just go, about him. go to wiki <laughs> go to wiki quote look up richard Feynman. it's like 20 pages of quotes going nah we can't really prove much with science well we can prove a little but we can't and it's really fun how he is with words yeah he had, he had a great one about um quantum physics is that um if you think you understand quantum physics then you don't. Wow. Because you you really in um, evoked Frank Zappa was when he said, oh, yeah. I'm a failure, but I'm not a miserable failure. You know? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. I mean, to, to be wrong is not, you don't have to be, you know, worried about it. Just use it as a building block. Yes. So, uh, let's close out soon here. Uh, Bradley, what, what one or two major questions on what we've talked about today remain unresolved for you? Is there any, like you can sum up a, a you mm. know, one or two elements that, you know. Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what, what that would be. Um, we haven't talked about entanglement. Oh, why don't you just tell, tell us what is, entanglement means? That is the biggest mystery of all. Okay. Um, because the double slit experiment and the uh, you know wave particle duality, I think I know the answers to that. Right. But entanglement, that I just can't understand what's going on here. I, I wish I wish Einstein were had lived long enough to prove you know to disprove the. Uh, the arguments that have been made about quantum entanglement. But what is it in, in, in lay person's terms? What do they mean by entanglement? Um, entanglement uh, usually applies to a small number of quanta, like two. Usually it applies to two quanta. It could in principle apply to more, but then it gets very complicated. But um, two quanta can be created or uh, interact in a way that they now have a, a wave function in common. There's a they're described together by quantum theory, and um, one of the ways that that Einstein tried to disprove quantum theory, he first first he invented quantum theory, and then he didn't like the direction that, that other scientists were taking it. So then he spent most of his life trying to disprove it. And he came up, he and uh, some of his colleagues at Princeton University came up with an argument that showed that quantum entanglement leads to predictions which are obviously wrong. Um, that he argued that uh, 
two, if you took two particles and that became entangled and you let them drift far apart from each other and they could drift an arbitrary distance away from each other. They could be, they could be billions of light years away from each other, you know, so far apart that you're sure that they could no longer be interacting. But if that entanglement were undisturbed and allowed to retain, be retained, then quantum theory says that if you disturb one particle, the other particle knows about it, is affected by it, and it's affected instantly, which is impossible according to the laws of relativity. And so Einstein thought, oh, he's proven that, you know, quantum, th quantum theory got screwed up, must be wrong. Well, um, many years later, after Einstein had passed away, they did experiments on this, and they, and the experiments seem to show, as far as almost everyone has agreed, that the particle far away does get affected instantly. And I've been trying to understand, you know, where, where they made a mistake. They must have made a mistake somewhere because <laughs> I, I just can't wrap my head around around this. Um, and so that, you know, that, that has been called the, the greatest mystery of the universe is how quantum entanglement can allow one thing to affect something, something far away, oh. very far away instantly. Yeah. Is that kind of like the the butterfly effect sort of thing? Like one thing happens here, and then a completely different thing happens. Um, is, 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 no, that, that's different. That gets, into, that, that gets into chaos theory. Right. Um, the fact that uh, a small change could sort of avalanche and lead to a large change, but that that happens slowly, um, and and that happens in a way that there's actually interactions which which get passed on to great distances you know the um the the molecules of air that get moved by a butterfly on one side of the earth eventually because of the winds and the air currents eventually it could affect the other side of the earth you know so that that's something that is understandable but entanglement is talking about um things that happen there could be no connection in between there could be light years of total vacuum in between them no way of communication no way of interaction at all and still one can affect the other instantly and um the way this is usually explained is is um is what they call uh they say quantum theory is non-localized so when something happens, it doesn't happen at a specific place. It happens everywhere, which I guess what they're saying is that everything in the universe is really at the same place. That the idea that things can be far apart from each other is an illusion. Really, everything is close to everything else. And a lot of physicists just seem to accept this, like, oh, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> I just can't. I just can't accept that, that kind of craziness. That is... That is just too crazy for me. I think I think uh, you you're a, a a wide open thinker, Bradley Bob's, because you do come to the Finnegan's Wake Reading Club, and you know we know that the wake is is um, everything that ever happened or will happen. And you know people go yeah. that bullshit, and, but if you read Finnegan's Wake out loud with a group of people, it is that it has that universality that it's a living yeah. organ. So yeah. it's sort of like taking entanglement theory, chaos theory, quantum theory, and, and uh, pushing it all into a big soup and what comes out, TikTok. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, gentlemen, this has been really fun. I think um, we can sum up with um, uh, what Bradley, you really, really came to a good point there saying, you know, this is a... a a question that remains unresolved for me so that we can have you back and, and get deeper in, in the swamp muck. McLuhan said the line, 
you mean my whole fallacy is wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's wrong. It could be worse than wrong. Yeah, it could be. It could, it could not even be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done unless you got something, Rob. Bradley, that was amazing. Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to say kind of to summarize it that nature, we try to anthropomorph anthropomorphize it by giving it these values of right, wrong, and otherwise. Yeah. When really, I mean, human beings, we yearn for patterns. We're meaning-making yeah. machines, right? Viktor Frankl said yeah. it very well, man's search for meaning. He was in the concentration camp witnessing atrocities that we can't even imagine. And he had to make a meaning from this. It couldn't just be, I'm here for no reason. I might as well just touch the electric fence right? I have to create meaning. But nature doesn't need meaning. Nature's just nature. It just does its thing, right? So yeah, you know, I, I I have a, a, a really bad physics joke for you. Somebody oh, well, asked me. I might, use, uh, I might add it to my lecture. So, yeah, <laughs> well, we're talking. Somebody says, you're anti-matter. I, and I said, I'm not anti-matter. What's the matter with you? <laughs> that's, my bad, that's my bad physics joke. What's the matter with yeah, you? That's, anyway. that's where uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle graduated from. What's the matter you? What's the matter you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you All guys right, very gentlemen. much. Thank you. That was okay. amazing. Okay. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.